Alright guys, welcome back to week 3 of trying to land a model rocket without using a parachute and just using thrust vector controls. Uh, still don't have a name for the rocket, it's been like 3 weeks, so for you two viewers out there that actually watch these videos, like shoot them in the comments. Don't shoot any bad words, Tyler, or, <laughs> or Dad, <laughs> matter of fact. Alright, so this week uh, I ran some simulations based on some specs I kind of picked out for the rocket, like uh, I'm assuming that we're going to be using a 3 inch diameter about maybe 0.025 of, of a drag coefficient. I know that's like really low, but I might end up changing that in the simulation later. I just use that for now. And as well as the um, a constant atmospheric pressure. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, factors, but we can go check out the um, simulation now. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and walk you guys through the simulation. To be honest, I might be walking myself through the simulation because it's been a minute since I've seen it. But on, here on the left, you have your time. Uh, I have timestamps for every, every data point that the thrust uh, curve was measured at. So each second represents a point on a curve that I, I got online where they tell me the amount of force in newtons of the, the motor that I wanted to use on this rocket. We also have the time interval, which will be important later when we start integrating, like we start taking the uh, area under the curve for our acceleration or velocity curve versus time. So our time interval is just the difference in time between like the first and second time stamp, second and third, and so on. I use, that's one of the reasons why I used Excel. Excel is kind of good for that. Like you can, you can really process a lot of information, just like data points, and just use like the same function over and over again, and it uh, auto-fills for you. And then here in our mass calculations, I realized that I needed to have these mass calculations after um, I started to notice like, you know, mass leaves the rocket engine as it's being fired. So you're obviously gonna have a change in gravity, like the force from uh, gravity, as the mass decreases on the rocket. So say uh, on my rocket, the propellant mass starts out at 40 grams, but then ends up at zero. So like, that's a pretty significant change in mass compared to a uh, one kilogram, uh, or 1.15 kilograms of uh, body mass. So yeah, pretty significant. And on the right of that, we have our aerodynamics block. So I used a fairly constant uh, pressure of air because uh, we're not going to be going that high and we're also not going to be dropping that far. So I just assumed that the air pressure would be about 1.225 uh, units of pressure. And I assumed that the drag coefficient would be fairly, fairly the same. And I assumed that it would be like roughly 0 0.025. That might be a little bit of an underestimate. I might end up having to bump that up. I might do some tests for the actual drag coefficient when I have the actual rocket assembled and everything. But right now, this is this is just uh, just to have an idea of how I would simulate this stuff, and uh, I could up, I could update these uh, numbers later in the future pretty easily. I would just replace the numbers and redo the simulation. The computer actually does that for me. And we also have our area. This I could easily calculate because I know for sure I'm going to be using a three. Well, I don't want to give. I don't want to say that I'm going to be using three inches in diameter for sure. But that's a that's the goal. <laughs> so that, that's that's a pretty reasonable. And that's the smallest confined space that I could figure out how to put a 29 millimeter uh, engine with a thrust vectoring mount in was three inches in diameter. So. I'm just assuming that I'm going to be using three inches in diameter. I calculated the area using like you know diameter of a circle to relate it to area. So I've calculated that that was about like 9.616 uh, units per area. And to the right of that, in order to calculate my current aerodynamic drag, you have to know like your prior velocity because um, aerodynamic drag is based on the square of your velocity. So in because this simulation can't, like, you would end up having a recursive formula if you were trying to use your current velocity to calculate your, um, your aerodynamic drag, which calculates your current velocity, you see you would have a recurring function. So instead I'm using my prior velocity to calculate my newer velocity. That way it gets rid of, uh, gets rid of that, um, that error. And for direction, 
uh, aerodynamic drag always acts opposite to your um, your angle of attack, I guess, or to your um, your velocity vector. So, like, if you're traveling up, your your um, aerodynamic drags would be pushing you down. So, in order to cap to get a number for that, I just took your velocity. You take the absolute value of your velocity and divide it by your velocity, and that would actually give you like your direction. And in order to calculate my drag, I just multiplied everything across in my aerodynamics block, squared the velocity, multiplied by a half, and that gives me the direction and the magnitude of my drag. So now you can see, like, as I'm speeding up, drag increases. As I'm slowing down, drag decreases. Stuff like that. And then also in my force block, I have um, my gravity force. So, uh, as I was talking about earlier, my force force of gravity is derived from my mass calculations and how when that decreases my force of gravity also decreases so that will affect the entire simulation and then again my thrust that's that's given by my thrust curve that I found online I'll put a link to the website in the description so to calculate the net force you just take the sum of all your three forces drag force of uh, gravity thrust right now I'm not accounting for lift because uh, very minuscule and actually I don't know if that might be true but I'm just not gonna account for it right now Bruh. All right, and to calculate my um, velocity gained, that is actually just the integral of your net force divided by your mass with respects to time. So the way I think about it is like I'm, I'm dividing by mass, I'm dividing my force by my, um, my net mass in order to get my acceleration, my current acceleration. And that acceleration acted over a tiny period of time AKA the time interval block in, a, in column B, I can multiply those two together, my time interval and my net uh, acceleration to get your change in velocity, since acceleration times time is your velocity. So that gives me my velocity gain, not my current state, because you're just uh, taking, a, you're just multiplying this uh, tiny portion of your, of your graph. So when you do this a bunch of times for every set of data, you end up getting like a, a bunch of tiny bits that tell you how much velocity you are either gained or, uh, or you decreased. So by taking a cumulative sum or an integral, I am able to find my net velocity by summing up all of those like increases or decreases. And that gives me my current like net velocity at each uh, timestamp. And then you do the same thing with uh, position, you would integrate your velocity with respects to time, like you're taking your velocity, multiplying it by a little chunk of time, your time interval, and that will give you your position. Or th that will give you your position gained or your position lost. So then you do a cumulative sum and you end up getting your net position. So that way I'm able to graph my net velocity and net position over time which we have here. And in order to figure out like what what speed I have to be going to and what uh how high I have to be dropping from in or in my simulation in order to have like a kind of like a smooth landing, uh I just plugged in numbers over and over till I got like uh some estimates for my height. All right, one way I can test that this simulation is reliable is by seeing when I hit terminal velocity. So I know terminal velocity happens when my force of gravity is equal to the aerodyna aerodynamic drag. So when the two forces are equal to each other, the force is acting downwards and your aerodynamic drag is acting upwards, they both cancel out so you have a net force of zero. So if you have a net force of zero, you should be traveling at a fairly constant velocity which is your terminal velocity. So I could end up replacing each side with force of gravity equals um, your aerodynamic drag, sulfur V, and turns out V is actually 8.74, which lines up with my simulation because my simulation actually shows that after about 10, uh, let's see, after about seven seconds of flight time or of falling, I hit terminal velocity. But that's all based on my initial condi uh, conditions. Like, I already started off at negative 8.15 meters per second. But that just goes to show that my actual calculations for uh, 
for aerodynamic drag and, uh, and your force of gravity to calculate terminal velocity actually corresponds with my simulation pretty well because they both spit out the same numbers. So I can uh, reasonably assume that my simulation is working out properly. All right, and to calculate uh, the best, the optimal values for my initial conditions, um, I was either debating launching after ter you hit terminal velocity or before. I think I get more advantages from launching after I hit terminal velocity because that that's when my velocity is fairly constant, and I could use that uh, to help me in my calculations for when I should when I should deploy and like when I should land, because unless there's like a really strong gust of wind that somehow like lifts the rocket um, I feel like like deploying the um, thrust vectoring unit and actually igniting it at terminal velocity um, helps me with my calculations because now I only have to worry about my height since velocity is constant and when I hit terminal velocity of uh, 8.15 meters per second which is pretty fast uh, I was able to figure out through my simulations and looking at my graph when or how high I should deploy the um, thrust vectoring and actually ignite the motor. So that turns out to be about three meters off the ground, which is kind of scary, but the simulation says uh, that I should be able to deploy about three meters off the ground and it starts to slow down and the velocity just about reaches zero meters per second while it's about zero meters off the floor, which is good because you want to when it's on the floor. You wouldn't want like traveling really fast and the floor or like hovering in the air and then hitting the floor. Uh, so I, I try to optimize the uh, position based on my constant terminal velocity in order to optimize my, my height that I should deploy it.